Hey, everybody. It's the Drive to School podcast. I am Pastor Goodman, your host. And joining me again today is my good friend, uh, Pastor Brad Meyer. How are you? You know what? We're doing good. I haven't had to shovel the driveway for two or three days, so that's a positive. That's a positive. It's different kind of shoveling up there, too. Like when we talk about shovel, like you're not moving just like a couple of inches of snow off to the side there, are you? No, I think the, well, the last big snowstorm we had, uh, I walked across the parking lot from the parsonage to the church, and I was walking through to my belt. And I, I'm six foot four. So, you know, this was a pile of snow and that's how deep the whole parking lot was. I mean, there wasn't a, a boot level anywhere. I mean, it was insane. And uh, thankfully, since then, it's been a few light dustings. That's more of your, you know, sweep off, you know, maybe scrape a little with the snow shovel. But this was call out the bobcats and the payloaders kind of snow. As a different, as a different level there. Yeah, I'm not ready for it. Um Let's just let's let's do this instead. All right. So um, we talk philosophy a lot and um, it, it's sort of a nice chance to slow down to think to sort of reason our way through things. Um, and I, I was chewing on this. Uh, we get real upset with Generation Z uh, because they they the youth, they're coming into adulthood now they're about 10 to, to 22 years old. They push off marriage. They they a lot of them don't plan on ever really having children. Uh, they, they treat uh, work as if it's a joke. Um, we, we, we sort of, you know, we want to say back in my day, we, we had more respect and, uh, you know, get, get up on our horses a little bit. But this is also a generation that has been raised without conclusions. Mm -hmm. like, like you think about this, they, they are raised on computers where scrolling is endless. We, we play uh, video games that have no real set and they just keep going and going work in a lot of cases is, is sort of detached from a concrete result where you can hold it up and say, I made this look at the thing. Um, in a lot of ways, if, if your entire youth is spent without the idea that a conclusion is possible, well, marriage is the conclusion of, of dating. Um, family is the conclusion of, of marriage. I, I guess it doesn't seem like an, a, an entire, a huge stretch to me that our, our youth and young adults would be sort of not all that eager for these things. What, what do you think? Well, I, I think we don't want to be too hard. I don't know. I don't know how old you are, but I'm a millennial. I'm one of the older yeah. millennials, but I'm Same. a millennial. And let's be honest, they didn't exactly learn these lessons from, well, they learned this stuff from us, right? We didn't set a good example. We, we yeah. did a lot of the same stuff. Right. And, and you know, our, our generation is the one that really emphasized experience, right? You know, you, you've got this emphasis on experiences. And I think Gen Z is kind of taking that to its logical conclusion. Because mm -hmm. it's more about the the travel along the way than about where you end up. And all that means is you end up not going anywhere with a lot of this stuff. Marriage, huh. career, work, community. I mean, all that stuff falls by the wayside. And then, you know, the, the communities and things that you do set up all become arbitrary because they're there to facilitate my experiences. You know, they're not, mm -hmm. they're not neighbors for me to serve. And, and that's a problem. Um, you know, philosophically, right? This is, this is, by the way, this is not just a, a generational thing. This has been out of vogue for couple hundred years now. Um, but we used to believe in something called teleology, right? That there were ends to things. They actually had purpose. And that's kind of been poo-pooed now for a few hundred years, but um, things have a purpose. I mean, that's our assertion as Christians. God didn't make this world arbitrary and empty and void and without meaning. He actually designed it to be a certain way. And, you know, philosophically speaking, when it comes to the function of things, their purpose, there's kind of two levels to that. There's an intrinsic teleology, and this is the one that's really hotly debated and, and mostly denied by modern philosophers, that, that by the nature and the existence of a thing, that it actually has a purpose, right? Hmm. Um, and then there's extrinsic uh, teleology or teleological Outside. function, which is that we, we impose it on there. So it's usually things we assign meaning to. So, you know, I have this cup, it holds my coffee, you know, it has a purpose, it has a function. If it's not doing that, you know, because it broke or something, then it ceased its function, it's not really useful to me anymore. And that's the problem with extrinsic um, um, teleology. It's all arbitrary. It's all just, you know, it re gets reduced to its uh, pragmatic functions, its, its usefulness, right? And uh, the intrinsic question is a very different one because we deal with things as they are, and we try to see that their value is part of what makes it it, right? Mm -hmm. Or I should say it's purpose. When I say value, I mean it's purpose. So, you know, if you think about a tree, right? I love trees. That's I don't know why that's always my favorite example, but it is. Probably because there's one right out my window here, but... Um, you know, so you think of a tree, right? What makes a tree a tree? Well, we can talk about it having bark and wood and, you know, leaves. And this particular tree is a butternut tree, so it makes nuts, right? Um, well, those things are all purposes in a way, right? They're all, they're all ends. You know, what's a tree doing if it's doing its job? It's growing, it's making leaves, it loses them in the fall. Um, it's getting wider every year, it's getting taller every year, maybe. Uh, and it makes the fruit of the tree, which is nuts, and then makes new baby trees. And those are all 
tied to what it is to be a tree. And so even when we try to deny that things have a purpose, we still talk about things like there is some sort of purpose attached to it. But like you were pointing out, you know, at the beginning here, um, when we deny purpose, when we deny that things have a proper end, you know, a proper function, um, we ultimately deny uh, certain segments of ourselves that leads to less than helpful outcomes when it comes mm -hmm. to things like family, when it leads to things like, you know, community, when it leads to things like just the, the joy of work, right? That's, that's one of my hobby horses. I'm trying to impress on the kids here that, you know, God doesn't give us work because he hates us. He gives us work because he loves us. And even if that work is working at the local gas station, convenience store and running the till, you're serving your neighbor by doing that. In fact, mm -hmm. our work is one of the places God gives us often our primary place of dealing with non-family neighbors, you know, and that's how we handle, handle them and deal with them. And it should be a joy to us to serve in this way. And uh, unfortunately, that's not the message you see on the TikTok, right? The I'm TikTok. old enough. I can call it the TikTok, right? Yeah, I do. <laughs> See, it's a millennial thing that we impose at least a little bit of irony and a little bit of whining about everything that we, we talk about too. So as Absolutely. long as we can, we can maintain the stereotype. So so here's the thing then, um, if, if marriage doesn't have a, a purpose, I guess, yeah, if, if you don't want to, don't don't even consider it. Or, or, or if, if, if kids don't seem like a, a, um, a natural end for, for a relationship, well, why would you, you, you end up losing something in that though, don't you? Well, you, you get stuck in yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. When things actually have a function that you put yourself, like say a social arrangement like marriage, when that actually has a function that is intrinsic to it, that it's by design, it's baked into the pie, as it were. Um, when I enter into that, I'm part of something beyond myself. It orients me away from myself. Which is and healthy. the problem with making it about, right, my experience, my ideas, my uh, enjoyment, whatever else. Or, I mean, you know, marriage, what is marriage in the common view today? It's I get, well, relationships in general, why do I enter a relationship with someone or increasingly someone's, right, is uh, it, it makes me happy. Well, then it's all about me, and I don't actually learn how to serve anyone. And interestingly enough, the more we focus on happiness, the more unhappy we become. Because huh. it turns out that the way this stuff is designed and the functions it's meant to have actually produces a kind of happiness that transcends immediate pleasure, right? You know, kids, pain in the butt sometimes. But I tell you what, my life's a whole lot better now that I have kids than it was ever before that. Worth Even though I got to do a lot more cool stuff, like go to brew pubs, and you know, that's a millennial thing, going to brew pubs, did a lot of brew pubs, went to fancy coffee houses that cost way too much. Mm -hmm. I don't do that anymore because I can't afford it. Yeah. And also I live in rural North Dakota and we don't have these things. <laughs> but uh, I tell you what, I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't go back, not for all the tea in China, as they say. Absolutely. So it's not even just sort of the, the sort of long-term contentment and, and even happiness that that can come from the conclusions that are rightly baked into creation but also when it only becomes sort of about the, the short-term happiness we lose sight of uh well genuine love for neighbor which is not based in happiness but in sacrifice so if we go to genuine love we i got to start with jesus uh who, who doesn't simply do what makes him happy in the moment but actually suck, suffers and sacrifices for me uh marriage becomes a picture then of christ and the church so that the the husband would would be uh the one who sacrifices for the bride if this is simply laid out to well what's going to feel good in, in that initial moment no but in the long run not not only a joy and a contentment that comes from this but an actual godliness that builds up out of something that is just the self because you're right if i just do what makes me happy i will be mildly happy until I realize that I'm actually profoundly unhappy all the time. But more than that, I'll never actually have my head lifted out of myself. Um, and, and we need that. We need to have our eyes fixed on not only a, a conclusion that is Christ and the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting, but but even just the idea that God has given you more than you tend to realize if you're only looking at the what feels good right now. Right. And, you know, this all goes with what we talked about earlier, that, that when we approach things philosophically, or in this case, it's, what we're really doing here is applied ethics, right? Um, when we approach this stuff, we need to realize that I don't start in here. As a Christian, when I do philosophy, it doesn't start in here or in here or any part of this. It starts with reality. And I have to actually see reality, deal with reality. And by that, I don't just mean the world around me that I perceive through my senses. I also mean the reality of the true and living God and what he says in his word, which is why when we want to know what marriage is, we don't start with reasoning about you know how buffalo mate in the wild or something like that. We start with what God says about it. And what he says about human beings. And then we work that out from there. Right. So, so, you know, going back to Ephesians five, that that's absolutely where we have to go. And it does orient me outside of myself. Cause again, you know, uh, I forget what his name is. I had a professor in seminary who, um, he, uh, 
he said that uh, uh, men are civilized when they get married and then they're matured when they have children. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I, there's something to that, right? Because you look at kind of the, the advice that we get culturally about how we're supposed to live. It's childish. Do what you want, when you want, throw a tantrum when you don't get your way. This is how my toddlers, you know, have behaved when they were that age, right? Mm -hmm. That's not how adults behave, but particularly men. You know, men don't behave that way. And then you look at the stuff like, um, you know, Andrew Tate's been in the news lately. And you look at the stuff he passes off as masculinity. It's having a lot of cars, making a lot of money, taking advantage of women. But that's not manliness. That's childishness. That's how little boys approach things. You know, a man actually gets married, defends his family. He gets something worth defending, right? He sees his family as an end in itself and something that's beyond his own personal needs. Whereas if I conceive of my relationships, my property, my possessions, my career as something just for me, I'm never going to be happy. And I'm always going to be stuck trying to prove to myself and other people that what I have is actually good and, and makes me happy. I mean, there's a reason he's so vocal on social media. He's trying to justify it as much to himself as anyone else. Right. And the other side of this is you become terrified of losing it because if it's all about the right now and there is no there is no resurrection, there is no actual end, then everything, everything not only can fall down, but but is going to. And you have to recognize that even as you're going through it, of course, I'd be angry. Of course, I'd be vulgar. Um, but it, inside of this, it. it if you approach life, if you approach the the creation, if you approach all the things that God gives as if there is no such thing as an end, um, all you have is the right now because you you end up being hopeless. There, there, there's nothing to actually look forward to that has already been established in a Christ who already bore your sins because I'm not a perfect husband and I don't perfectly have joy in my kids the way I ought to. I can go through the list and sort of lay out all of the things that, that I ought to be. And, and well, sometimes I'm a sinner, but my my fear is no longer established and well if i'm a big enough sinner my world will fall apart i can do a lot of damage by my sin and i should strive against it i, I have to strive against it but my hope is ultimately that that no matter how hard i build no matter how much i try my hope is that my salvation's already been secured in in that last great day the resurrection and that's a beautiful hope because it's not a hope that's a pie in the sky wish it's a hope that you know is fulfilled in christ christ and seen and evidenced by god's actions in history right? Hmm. And that's, that's a beautiful thing. You know, I, I just, you know, you, you look at, you know, our generation and the people coming up after us and just this attentiveness to the now. And, you know, there's, there's, I just, I, I like to, I like to listen to some financial podcasts and stuff because, you know, pastors don't make a lot of money. Well, I shouldn't say that. My church takes care of me. I'm not complaining about what they pay me. But, but you're you know, never going to be Andrew Tate. But you know, I listen okay. to it mostly because I like to hear people who can't balance their own checkbook. You know, I find this comical. I, it's a little schadenfreude. I am a sinner. And um, anyways, I was listening to this and they were, the hosts were reading a, a news report about Gen Z and how they have, since the pandemic started, have stopped contributing. 56% of respondents did not contribute to their retirement since the pandemic shutdown started. 56% because the focus is on the right now and they're not thinking long term. And thinking about things this way, I mean, just on a practical level, it doesn't work because someday you're going to get old and you're not going to be able to work anymore and you need to be able to eat, right? And uh, you can't guarantee that things like Social Security are necessarily going to be there because a lot of the projections say it's not. And so, you know, you take care of stuff. But it's part of this mindset that the moment matters, the experience right now matters, that there's no function or end to things. There's not really even a tomorrow that we have to worry about. So on the one hand, you know, it's it's this profound nihilistic denial of, of reality. On the other hand, there's also a hubris in this, right? There's sort of a, an implied invisibility that I'm just going to constantly make it through all this stuff and everything's just going to work out and I don't have to actually try or do anything. And as a pastor, this really frustrates me, particularly when it comes into the church. You know, we dress it up in piety like, well, God will provide. Okay, but God works through means. And one of those means is the possibility of the amount of money we can raise at our church, for example. So we have to actually pass a budget that's realistic. And, you know, when we do building campaigns, they need to be realistic. We can't just, you know, wish for money to fall out of the sky. That doesn't happen. If it does, great. God be praised. But let's be realistic because that's how God wants us to take care of stuff is to think and to use our brains and to worry about things long term and not just, you know, dwell in the moment all the time. You know, um, what is that? A carpe diem, right? Seize the day is not a Christian li uh, lifestyle maxim. <laughs> That's fair enough. All right, you got me a lot to, to kind of think about here. So so how would we kind of sum up then uh, uh, to somebody who, who is struggling with the idea of that conclusions are a normal part of life? Well, I here's the problem, right? The person who's, who's convinced that tomorrow isn't going to bring anything good, and so I have to do everything today 
you know, th this is where the nihilism comes in, right? The, the, the depression, the, the um, lack of confidence in, in a favorable um, disposition on God's part to provide for us, whether or not they claim to be a believer in God, that's the fundamental, you know, view here. Um, we have to first uh, realize that that person is going to be very hard to convince otherwise. And so um, you may not have much success with that. But for us Christians, I think it comes back to the, you know, the fourth petition of the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. We live as if there's a tomorrow because God has promised to take care of us all days. So as much as it's good for us to plan ahead and all that, it's also good for us to even more trust in God and to realize that he's going to provide for us. And to recall that that doesn't mean that God's just going to take care of us no matter how foolish we are, but that God provides to us things through means and gives us brains and minds and dispositions to steward these things. Um, it also reminds us that things have a purpose. Right, that there's actually purpose baked into stuff by its by virtue of its existence. You and I and all people, you know, the folks listening to us, you people, you all have purpose and value because God made you. Period. Full stop. End of story. I mean, you exist, therefore you have value and purpose. But that's also true for the social things that God gives us, like communities, like our church congregations as a social reality, like marriage. Right. You know, these things all have purpose. They all have a point. They all have a function. It's a reality that we can form ourselves to that we fall into rather than something that we try to adapt and manipulate for our own purposes. You know, you look at the six commandment stuff, which is always the, the bane of every pastor these days. You have all these people trying to have all the benefits of marriage without any of the responsibility and always crashes and burns. Right. You know, there's a reason God wants the things, the benefits, the joys of marriage to be in marriage because there is accountability in that there's safety in that there's promises and fidelity in that. And, um, and it's true with all this other stuff as well, right? God designed it to work this way on purpose to protect us, you know, to give us a horizon beyond our own immediate desires and sinful um, predilections. And I think that's something that we ought to hold on to. And again, this is not a, a, a worldview that makes sense outside of Christianity. And you look at modern science and, and you know, scientism and all that, uh, they just would wholeheartedly reject this because, the, you know, they get it. If you admit this, then you admit there's some intelligence coordinating this stuff and making it be this way. And so you're tacitly admitting there is a God. And since we believe in God, I don't think we need to get into any of these stupid games because we can just say, hey, God made it. It's got a purpose. It's got a function. It's something good. It's by God's design. And God loves me. And therefore, when he gives me these things, it's not to imprison me. It's not to bind me. It's not to make my life stink. It's to actually give me something that's joyful and good and worth being a part of, whether that's marriage or your job or just, you know, planning for tomorrow. That's awesome. Pastor Bradmeyer, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today on Drive School. Well, thanks for having me. Have a good one, man. Yeah, you too.